Hi, I'm just going to welcome people to this panel discussion um, today that we have been looking forward to, to hosting for quite a while and we have a really great group of people um, who will self-introduce, but um, basically it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to be showing a recorded presentation from Juan Garibay, who's a researcher at the Curry School in, in University of Virginia. Um, and um, we've got sensor familiars like um, Cheryl, Cheryl Broverman, who a lot of people know already, with Brian Dewsbury, who's new to sensor, and Pat Marsteller, who has been a fellow traveler for a long time um, in her own work with sensor. So I'm going to start off, we're going to start off with, with a sort of research oriented uh, material about the, the importance of social justice and, and basically equity focused educational questions. Um, in embedding them in the curriculum. So I'm gonna start running this by uh, this presentation by Juan and he'll be followed by Brian who will then be followed by uh, Cheryl who would then be followed uh, by Pat. Hello everyone. My name is Juan Carlos Garibay and I'm a professor of higher education at the University of Virginia. I am excited uh, to have this presentation shown to you all today about my research on social justice and STEM integration, showing how it matters and what factors promote or hinder the inclusion of social justice in STEM curricula. Before I get into the research, I'd like to start off by grounding the presentation on several debates that are happening in STEM higher education. First focuses on the purpose of STEM education. The purpose of STEM education and definitions of STEM student success are often subjects of great debate. STEM education researchers, practitioners, and policymakers, whether explicitly or implicitly, communicate and often emphasize particular qualities and competencies they believe STEM graduates need to effectively address the significant challenges of the present and future. On one side, much of the mainstream discourse in the US on the purpose of STEM education is centered on the need to maintain US global economic competitiveness. These economic centered perspectives have largely framed the purpose of STEM education and definitions of STEM student success to mostly consider students STEM proficiencies and degree attainment as the ultimate measures of success. However, on the other side, many scholars of STEM education have advocated for a more comprehensive definition of STEM student success to include social justice outcomes by connecting STEM to democracy. With democracy, as the purpose of STEM education, important student outcomes move beyond simply acquiring STEM knowledge, STEM competencies, and degrees. As these traditional academic measures of STEM student success do not specifically address the importance of developing future leaders in STEM fields who are committed to creating a more equitable society. Scholars contend that without concern for the social good or injustice, prioritizing capital's needs in STEM education can easily serve to reproduce the dominant social order and disregards the importance of developing marginalized students' transformative potential to critique and improve the conditions of their lives using science and mathematics. This debate is significant in the context of social justice and STEM integration because how the purpose of STEM education is defined becomes an organizing force that may or may not allow opportunities for the inclusion of social justice. Second, can STEM career advising create inequities as well? Career advising has largely been driven by vocational theory 
that treats academic environments or academic majors as fixed, as fixed environments, and that students should be guided into those majors that best fit their interests. While on the surface this may seem race neutral, vocational theory suggests STEM is incongruent with social concerns. So it is defined as incongruent with social justice. So students who are interested in STEM and social justice and research suggests that these are more often students from minoritized backgrounds may be more likely to be guided away from STEM. And third, the inclusion of race in the curriculum is currently a major national issue, with some states banning the use of critical race theory in the curriculum, while on the other end, many students of color have protested and demanded for greater diversity in the curriculum as part of larger campus movements for racial justice. So my research has informed these debates and revealed the importance of the integration of social justice and STEM in several ways. First, it has shown that there are limitations to STEM education and the training of future STEM professionals for social justice. Second, it has revealed that STEM students from marginalized backgrounds tend to care more about working for social justice, which has implications for broadening participation in STEM. And that in integrating social justice into the STEM curriculum may promote access and enrollment in STEM programs. Okay, so now I'll go over some of the research studies that I have published that focus on the importance of social justice and STEM integration. My first study in this area, titled STEM Students' Social Agency and Views on Working for Social Change, leveraged a national longitudinal sample of over 6,100 undergraduates to examine whether there are differences between STEM and non-STEM students on the importance of working for social changes to their career goals and their level of social agency, which is an outcome that measures their value on taking social political action to promote a more equitable society. Major findings from this study reveal that undergrads who majored in STEM had lower social agency outcomes at the end of college than their non-STEM counterparts, as well as lower values on working for social change. This study's findings demonstrated a critical issue in STEM training and STEM student development that has important implications for society and addressing social injustices. After finding out about the limitations of STEM training, I then sought out to examine what types of college experiences and institutional contexts predict the long-term development of STEM students' desire to promote a more equitable society through social political involvement and through research. Using a national longitudinal data set of over 6,300 STEM bachelor's degree recipients. This study, titled Beyond Traditional Measures of STEM Success, long-term predictors of social agency and conducting research for social change. I examined STEM students between their first year of college and seven years after college entry. This study is the first known study on the long-term predictors of social justice outcomes of STEM bachelor degree recipients and demonstrates the importance of majors, faculty, and peers in this process. First, Engineering majors had lower social agency and engineering majors and health professional science majors had lower values towards conducting research for social change. Second, research and mentorship experiences with faculty promoted students' values towards conducting research for social change, but not their social agency. 
And additionally, students who attended institutions where STEM faculty on average have higher civic minded values, promoted their, their social agency over the long term. Next, integrating social justice in STEM has important implications for broadening participation in STEM. As research consistently shows that marginalized and minoritized students in STEM care more about social justice. My paper titled STEM Students Social Agency and Views on Working for Social Change found that among STEM majors, working for social change is more important to the career goals of underrepresented students of color. The second paper I discussed on the previous slide also found that among STEM bachelor's degree recipients, underrepresented students of color had higher social agency and views toward conducting research for social change. Women had higher social agency and higher SES students had lower value toward conducting research for social change seven years after college entry. Additionally, a paper that I published in 2020 titled can Holland's person environment fit theory produce troubling outcomes for racial and ethnic underrepresented students in STEM found that among STEM bachelor's degree recipients, underrepresented students of color who graduated from or were enrolled in a STEM graduate professional program or were in the STEM workforce had higher social agency than their white peers. Lastly, while courses that integrate social issues and STEM content, such as censor courses, have been developed and included in some STEM departments in order to increase the inclusivity of the STEM curriculum, little is known about whether such courses may promote access to STEM fields. My research in this area is particularly novel, and to investigate questions related to social justice in STEM curricula, I have primarily focused my inquiry on interdisciplinary environmental and sustainability degree programs, particularly because many environmental fields are among the most racially homogenous, predominantly white fields in all of higher education. And interdisciplinarity is becoming more significant in science and engineering fields. Using national data from the National Council for Science and the Environment's 2012-2013 survey of IES academic programs, I led a collaboration with colleague Dr. Shirley Vincent to investigate whether IES programs have greater inclusion, that have greater inclusion of environmental justice or racial justice content are significantly more likely to report increases in the enrollment of students of color. This study called Racially Inclusive Climates Within Degree Programs and Increasing Student of Color Enrollment an Examination of Environmental and Sustainability Programs helped to expand racial climate research by connecting the racial climate to our understanding of college major choice and showed that greater inclusion of racial justice content or environmental justice predicted increases in student of color enrollment in IES programs. So with these research studies revealing various ways integrating social justice in STEM is significant, how can we integrate it more into STEM departments? And specifically, given that this is being presented at the Sensor Summer Institute, how can it be integrated more in the STEM curriculum? My research has also explored this question and has revealed several important barriers and factors along this process, such as the importance of faculty values, program and institutional characteristics, and race and positions of power within programs.
Okay, so first, it's important to note that faculty values matter for social justice inclusion in STEM curricula. In a paper titled, Diversity Content in STEM, How Faculty Values Translate into Curricular Inclusion Unevenly for Different Subjects in Environmental and Sustainability Programs, my colleagues Dr. Shirley Vincent, Dr. Paul Ong, and I examined whether IES faculty members' educational values may predict the inclusion of particular content differently for various subject areas, with a particular focus on environmental justice or racial justice content. Findings reveal challenges for including environmental justice content in the curriculum development process. As the relationship between values and inclusion is lower for EJ content in comparison to other content areas in IES programs. In other words, valuing environmental justice does not automatically translate into inclusion in the curriculum as it does for some other content areas, revealing inequity in this process. There are other program and institutional factors at play as well. This study helps to address an important theoretical and empirical gap as prior higher education curricular development theory does not make this inequity explicit. Okay, so what are some of the, uh, those additional program and institutional level factors at play? Another study with my colleagues titled Program and Institutional Predictors of Environmental Justice Inclusion in U.S. post-secondary environmental and sustainability curricula found that doctoral research universities have a direct negative effect and indirect negative effect on environmental justice inclusion through faculty values towards EJ content. Additionally, programs with increasing enrollment of students of color promoted greater environmental justice inclusion while those that are primarily STEM have an indirect negative effect on EJ inclusion through faculty values towards EJ content. Thus, student care demographics within the program, academic discipline, and Carnegie classification each play a role in whether environmental justice gets included at a greater level in IES programs. And lastly, an additional study that I'm working on is focused on the racial demographics of IES program leaders. And it's revealing that over 90% of program leaders of these programs um, in environmental and sustainability uh, fields are white, which is important because it's helpful to think about who or what racial group has the most power over what is taught and whose knowledge is important in the curriculum. Finally, I'm leading a research project uh, with doctors Lindsay Wheeler and Rosalind Byrne, both at the University of Virginia, that is examining the educational impact of STEM courses that integrate issues of social or racial inequality and diversity that was funded by the UVA Three Cavaliers Research Program. Our goal is to better understand what educational and career impact do do courses that integrate social justice and STEM have on students? With this pilot work, we will be developing surveys to conduct a national study and would love to include censored courses as part of this project. Thank you all so much. And I'm glad it's recorded so we can put it up in the program so that people can, can see it. And I already have like a bunch of people I want to send it to, including the, the uh, people who are doing the um, climate justice module design, um, 
from from the two community colleges in the West because I think this is important research for them to understand the context on why it's important to, you know, what they're doing is important. Um, so the next, our next speaker is Brian Dewsbury, who um, has, it hasn't been involved in censor, although he's censor adjacent because he's been, uh, he knows Pat and he knows um, a, another very old censor person, David Green. So, um, and I'm sure there are many others that I don't know about. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brian. David, I can't believe she didn't mention that I, I, I know that I know you. I mean, that, that should have been like the first name <laughs> of the list of names that that should right. have been. But David knows everybody, so it just goes. That is that. true. That is true. Well, like, I will say I will say that Pat and I met when I was a sophomore at Morehouse College. I did a summer program at Emory University that she directed. So Pat Pat wins this game by a long shot. She <laughs> she met me when I was 20 years old, guys. Right. So it's it's been a, a good journey. Um, so good to be here. Good to not be adjacent anymore, I suppose, <laughs> to be uh, perhaps part of the crowd finally. Um, you know, when Davida reached out, uh, she one of the things that was asked is to kind of talk about the research that we're currently interested in and you know, I, I decided to go the no slides route because selfishly I try to avoid slides whenever I get the opportunity to do that. And I wanted to perhaps just spend the next 10 minutes or so talking to you about how my program has shifted a little bit over the years in response to where we see the pressing needs for uh, diversity and equity are, right? Uh, my name is Brian Dewsbury, for those who I've never met. Um, I, I, I was up until about a month ago an associate professor of biology at the University of Rhode Island. I've transitioned to Florida International University this summer where I'm, I'm an associate professor, but I'm also associate director of the STEM Transformation Institute. And we'll be leading some projects there on um, science communication, uh, more faculty development, and of course, continuing the inclusive education research that we do. Um, I. I, I did enjoy the first many, many years doing, you know, what, what perhaps was mostly classroom research. And I think, um, I, you know, I think this crowd mostly believes the hype or believes the evidence of active learning and inclusive teaching and its outcomes. Um, one of the biggest, uh, like perhaps biggest barriers we've encountered in faculty development is con convincing faculty to sacrifice the all and almighty content. <laughs> in favor of actually enacting inclusive practices. And so we have a paper coming out this fall that will show the impacts of that. Um, but, but I wanna maybe talk a little bit on you know, a little bit of a broader scale because I, I would say in the, I don't know, 10 plus years I've been part of this conversation. I've, I, I feel like it's evolved in ways that, that are not necessarily always helpful, right? So, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the, 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 the narrative, the, the weed out narrative was all about what the students couldn't do, right? They were not prepared, they, were ne they couldn't study right, they, you know, students, 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 and so, but then also this notion that you can only pass 15% of your class, there, there was a little bit of an ego attached to that, right? Oh, you know, my class is so, you know, esoteric and highfalutin that only, only these 15 best students are, can make it to the next semester. I, I will say that the, the uh, a lot of that narrative has changed. I think that I think we, we're in a little bit of a better place with that, right? Um, you know, maybe the pendulum, you know, depending on where you are, the pendulum has swung maybe a little bit too far. But uh, it's funny. Every time I read Chronicle of Higher Ed, I would say there's like a, a eight month cycle where somebody would write an op ed talking about you know lecturing is fine. And then the active learning mafia would be like, oh, no, 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 you must do active learning all the time, every single half second. And, and I was like, okay, like I, I, I do active learning, but, but could we just relax a little bit? Because the, the, you know, we're still just talking about how to get content across, right? And I, and I felt like both sides of that argument always missed the point. There's a really beautiful paper written in 1996 by Elizabeth Mohey in Reading Research Quarterly. And the title of the paper is, I teach students, not subjects. 
It's an ethnography. She did an ethnography of a chemistry high school teacher. And that's the title of the paper, right? So if you kind of sit with those words for a while, you, you automatically have a different framing of what it means to be an educator, what it means to be in a classroom, right? So I, I certainly don't believe, right? And, and this is, and many of you have taught many more students than I have, but I've yet to meet this student who, says, who says, I just paid $25,000 or $50,000 in tuition. I'm looking to gather as many Fs as I can. That's my goal here. I just want to get those Fs and fail out because I just want to be in debt for a degree I'm not going to get. I have not met that student, right? I, I understand that sometimes when you see the results in your classroom, you might feel that's how, you might think that's how they feel, but I actually don't believe that's how they feel. Likewise, I actually haven't met the faculty member, even some of the most inert, some of the most intransigent, some of the most you know, rebellious, who really truly just want every student to fall flat on their face. And I know, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but I'm a Steven Pinker fan just for this particular thing. I, mean, I, don't, I don't always agree with Steven Pinker, but I do take the, I believe in your better angels approach. Right? I do believe that the faculty member deep down wants people to love physics. I do think deep down, they want people to love biology, to love chemistry. And I do believe deep down the students want the same thing. So the question then, to take an Abram Kendi type of lens here, how do you design a system that empowers both of these actors to be their best selves? That's a different kind of question because in, in the first narrative, you're looking for people to demonize, right? You're looking for the students who don't study, right? Okay, it's your fault and that's why you couldn't pass this class. In option B, you're looking for the faculty who wouldn't just drink all the Kool-Aid, the active learning Kool-Aid and say, oh, because of you, <laughs> all of these students are failing. In well, option C, right? You're thinking, well, what are the policies and procedures we need to have in place? to ensure that people see that this organization is communicating that inclusive practices is what we value here. And once we start asking those kinds of questions, it forces us to address the elephants in the room that quite frankly, we have been a bit too coward to take on to this point, right? Because what would happen is I would be, you know, I have the privilege of traveling the country to talk about inclusive teaching and running workshops. But these super inspired faculty will go back to their colleges and like, I'm still paid $50,000 less than research faculty. I'm still on one year contracts. I'm still reviewed only on student evaluation, which is asking, you know, if I smell nice, right? I'm still being evaluated for teaching by people who don't know how to evaluate teaching. So, so write me your Black Lives Matter statements all you want. But what I'm interested in is your budget. I'm interested in your hiring policies. I'm interested in the support structures and the professional development that you provide for the people who do the thing that you claim is the most important function of your organization. So my work has shifted to, to, to uh, engage. There are a few uh, colleges who I'll not name right now, but um, who are taking this on on a departmental level who are saying that we are okay with starting from ground zero. We are okay saying, imagine we didn't have to take that textbook, right? Imagine we didn't have to, you know, follow this particular, you know, molecules to, to ecosystem. Imagine if we centered who we are actually teaching first before we started to design things that, that we claim are good for them. And, and maybe then and only then will we stop you know, making these offerings <laughs> that seem good to us on paper. But then when we get the feedback, the students are saying, yeah, it's interesting, but this doesn't really connect to my values. Yeah, it's interesting. Like the previous speaker said it in a recorded talk, right? This doesn't encourage me to, to get into social change. Yeah, it's interesting, but you taught a whole bio class and then mentioned Tuskegee study not once, right? <laughs> Yeah, this is interesting, but you think, 
that science and the way we operate in everyday society are different when it's clear it is not. Because I'm watching black and brown people die from COVID at an alarmingly higher rate. So I, I'm seeing it. But you still want to talk, you know, just focus on, well, you know, viruses are really interesting because they insert their DNA into the cell. Okay, that is interesting. But <laughs> there's, there's impacts to what viruses do. Let's talk about that too, right? So when Elizabeth Mohe talks about, we teach students and not subjects. We have to remember that you know, teaching subjects really relies on subject matter expertise. We've been brought up in STEM, woefully so, in a system that has communicated to us that because we are great physicists and chemists and cell biologists, ergo, we are okay to teach in our classroom. And this couldn't be further from the truth. There, 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 there's a psychology associated with how you motivate students, how you motivate each other, particularly at the intro level, that we are now trying to workshop people into from the back end, which is really unfortunate. Having said that, I'm glad that we are because you know people like yourself who are here and, and the other conferences that we go to and have this conversation, people are waking up, right? But then let's also look a little bit further back in the system and think about where people are getting their graduate degrees in STEM, if you are telling them that if, if you choose to go on to be faculty, if that's a professional goal of yours, it behooves those programs to have a meaningful training component that focuses on the depth of inclusive teaching. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say inclusive teaching because honestly, good teaching is inclusive, right? I kind of have to say that now because it's still a catchphrase, right? And I, I don't mean the one hour workshop. I don't mean the, you know, you know, go to this one thing that the video is offering in the student. No, 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 I, a year, two years. It's, it's a job. And, and so when you do that, now you can have expectations at the hiring level. Now you can say, no, 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 you will not walk on this campus unless you demonstrate to us in your application and through real evidence that you understand what it means to teach inclusively, right? So the system is not just where we are now as faculty, it's, it's all the way before that point. Um, it, it's, a, it's a politically fraught area. You know, I, I can't stress how many conferences on teaching and workshops and inclusive teaching and all these things I've been to. And, and it, it actually is remarkable to me how nobody talks about the political structure of teaching. Um, you know, lecturers who don't get to vote in faculty senate, oh no, all these kinds of things. Like they sidestep that stuff, man, like a bad relationship. It's really <laughs> funny. Um, so so I, I, I'm saying that to you because that's the space we're going to go into now. If you're going to get serious, this work has to happen at a systemic level. So I'll stop there. Thanks for your time, everybody. And, um, you know, we have so much time to talk afterwards, but I think I'll toss the battle in a much cleaner way than the US 4x400 team. To Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, I said it. Sorry, sorry. I watched it. It was bad. Uh, Cheryl, there you go. <laughs> We're all voting for you to have a podcast as, that we'll listen yeah. to and sign up for all the time. Yeah. And become you know, president of a new university. Um, you should. Nancy, you're, pre you're going to be president, Brian. You don't know yet, but we're at. Not of the, of the country. You could do that too, but they meant we're of a new university. I may, have to, I may have to borrow Obama's birth certificate or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a really hard thing to follow because, um, Brian, you said so many wonderful things that aren't often included in. Um, Kind of conferences, those you, know, you hit on a lot of sensor themes. I'm trying to get this screen set. You guys see my screen? Okay, I am unfortunately going to have some slides. I'm going to echo so a lot of the things um, that I think both Juan and, and Brian alluded to. I'm just going to move it over there and so um, and bring in some of my work uh, in Kenya. And well, let me just let me just get started. Um, I really love it's a 
Social ecology is a concept that came out of psychology and behavioral ecology of looking at behavior change. Um, I've been someone who's working on HIV, and you know, all the evidence shows that telling someone to change their behavior uh, does up absolutely nothing depending on their interpersonal relationships, their institutional, all the ecosystems of uh, reinforcement of values and behavior. And um, I think, uh, Brian, this is what you were alluding to, some of the race research. We used to have underrepresented groups and say they need to study harder, they don't know how to adjust, they're in the wrong majors, without looking at all the different factors and all the different levels of impact that kept them from actualizing their full potential. I was thinking of looking at this um, for ju social justice at the university level. Um, we have individual faculty who try and do it in their courses. You might have colleagues who reinforce you. If you're lucky enough to have the dean, chair, provost at the institutional level doing more than lip service to it. Um, you have uh, different organizations. And then uh, we have, I originally said NSF and NA National Academy, and I just put state legislatures in there, <laughs> perhaps having a negative indirect effect. And from the beginning, I've been going to censor about 20 years. Censors always seen this as an ecosystem, which is why they've always brought in, in deans and chairs to, uh, to reinforce kind of that would happen at the individual level. But we're seeing lots of different movement in the field of social justice, diversity, inclusion, which none of us have really defined right now, at different rates at different pl at places. And you might have a faculty member doing something and the chair suppressing and a chair really gung-ho and a recalcitrant faculty. And you really need to be able to align the whole ecosystem to get any kind of success, which is why David is starting a new university. Um, this is something I really got engaged with in my work in Kenya, looking at the um, educational outcomes for adolescent girls in rural Kenya. Um, I work and start work started and work with an organization called the Wiser NGO because uh, we believe in girls thrive, communities thrive, and we have girls thrive through transformative educational practices. And again, um, when I started partnering with my Kenyan researchers, which I actually met via censor. Um, they were telling the girls to work harder, to pray to God and work harder and study harder because none of no girl had passed high school in 30 years in the school district. Um, and that became pretty evident, obviously, that there was um, there was a social ecology and we had to change the ecology. And so we created a new model for a gender safe school, which removed um, school related gender based violence. Um, which is everything, not beyond physical, which was a lot, but really psychological violence and stress. And that is the parallels to what's needed in the US right now of social and emotional safety at the institutional level being critical. And Juan alluded to some of that in his talk. Um, and again, where you can see, you know, it's great when all these things reinforce in most universities, people are being tugged in different directions. So I'm really gonna talk about um, how to try and do this and also the importance of social and emotional safety um, for, for good learning. Um, just little, those of you who aren't familiar with some of my work in Censor, um, we've had really dramatic outcomes. We use Kenyan teachers, the Kenyan curricular, curriculum. We're in one of the most poor, poorly performing school districts, but by changing the philosophy and of the school, uh, we have 100% graduation versus six regionally, 98% of our girls go on to tertiary education compared to 20% um, in the province. And our students earn government scholarships at five times the national rate because they score so high. And that is all through no content change. I shouldn't say that. We've actually done some really amazing um, applied workshops um, for social justice, but mostly, um, recognizing they are allowed to be their whole selves and be safe in a school system. And psycho I'm gonna talk a bit more about psychological safety. Okay, also to go down at the very individual level, um, I have my own data that is similar to what Juan uh, talked about underrepresented groups. I've been teaching course on HIV AIDS for 22 years. Um, the word black is how Duke initially was collecting demographic data. Um, there is at least double the number of black students enrolled in this STEM class compared to the uh, population of Duke at large. Um, also an increase in women for the most part because uh, while it's a biology class, a virology class, we look at drug policy, the prison system, um, history of racism in the US, redlining, all those things as well. 
it's a classic sensor model. I'm not going to preach the sensor model. There was a really great workshops on that. I'm happy to show you some examples later on, though. This is a topic we've been talking a lot about sensor since the beginning that um, started out with non-majors courses. And um, Brian brought up the whole holy uh, content. You can't mess with the content. Um, social justice tends to be in non-majors courses because there's a lot of faculty discomfort. So you get a self-selected group of people who are willing to do it. Certainly in my, I shouldn't, I'd be careful, this is being recorded. Um, I have many colleagues on campus who basically assume any social justice by definition makes it a non-majors class. And that's a kind of social hierarchy of uh, ecology issue that needs to change. A lot of faculty insecurity, and uh, insecurity on how to talk about things, um, uh, which we could talk about more. And this, and this is the most usually, well, it's not appropriate in my class because or I have no time in this regular kind of STEM class. It should go into those non-majors interdisciplinary special classes. And I think that's something um, that obviously needs to change. Um, and again, that has to happen at higher levels to get it throughout the whole curriculum rather than just one faculty. But I'm gonna try and picture a cranky faculty, your personal favorite or least favorite faculty and how you would talk to them about this is what I, the way I sort of try to structure this talk. Um, also, go back and look at Jay Labov's comments in the opening presentation that there's a false dichotomy between science and civics. Um, again, huge amount of data that increasing civic components increases, re recruits people into the sciences, retains them in the sciences, builds, there's a lot of data on the emotional connectivity to content leading to greater retention, a lot of brain science about this. Um, you don't have to do one or the other, they can be reinforcing. I certainly, Jay mentioned using coronavirus and doing more than virology. I've um, developed a whole course basically on coronavirus, looking at how the impact of racism changes physiology in people who have been exposed to it and predisposes them to worse outcomes for coronavirus. So while still teaching biology. So here's a few strategies for social justice. And I'm using that very broadly. That could be different content. That could be a different climate. That could be the inclusive classroom, which should be what all classrooms are. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking there's really three main domains that we, you can all work on these in different levels at different times, you can layer them in. Um, the easiest one is to try and set up an appropriate classroom environment. Um, we all expect our students to just bring their brains to class, not their bodies and their stress and their adrenals and all the other parts of their body. We expect them to be just thinkers, but we also expect them to just bring parts of their brain. Um, brains are managing lots of different components of their lives at once. Um, classrooms include both reward centers of the brain of advancement and growth and strong threats, embarrassment, rejection, isolation, being the only one of something in the classroom, whether it's a woman in an engineering class, a hijabi woman, an underrepresented person of color. Um, and all of these threats turn on the amygdala, part of the brain which processes social threat, and it is on sustained vigilance for signs of social threat. And students might have social threat from the campus they're on, from seeing what's happening in the news, from the classroom they just came out of where a professor was inappropriate. And if you build up too much cognitive load in this part of the brain, you shut down the reticular activating system, which means you can't actually process information as well. Um, that filters and organizes and shut down by the amygdala. And um, there's a lot of great brain science that how to make a warm and welcoming classroom is to learn how to calm the amygdala and allow the rest of the brain work. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, not sure how many are familiar with it. Um, you need to keep your body safe and then you, you need to do that to be, do any of these others. I'm, get, I'm moving fast because I'm trying to be respectful of time. There's a big psychological in the beginning. Um, this again is something we addressed when we built our model for the school in Kenya um, and data, one and what I guess Brian was going to talk about <laughs> from talking to him the other day. 
um, you know, we had to look at the gendered aspect of food and water, but you have to be safe. You have to feel safe to learn. That there's just basic physiology on that. So psychological safety matters. Um, not always available to BIPOC students or women in male dominated fields. So how do you engender psychological safety? We've got to quiet the amygdala. I'm happy to share a lot of references on the brain science of this. And there's obviously very great books putting this all together. A lot of this an individual faculty can do. They, by their actions, their words, their syllabus, their structure, say, you're welcome, you're safe. I recognize you have a complicated lived experience. You can bring all of yourself to this classroom. I'm not going to expect you to turn off the last racial shooting that you just saw and think about chemistry. I'm going to recognize that that is still with you and you are still processing that. Um, there's some simple steps. I put them on because we're all supposed to be doing it now. And they, I don't know if there's been any data on whether they work in isolation. Um, certainly diversity statements. I'm against boilerplate because it looks like boilerplate and your chair made you do it. I think you need to personalize it. Um, talking about growth mindsets. I talk about how much I learn con constantly. Um, land acknowledgements. It just looks like virtue signaling your dean passed it out. So I think these are necessary, but not sufficient. But your syllabus can say a lot to people and how much of your warmth and humor you put into it. But I think a lot of that is also the instructor's verbal acknowledgement of external stressors. Um, whether it's talking about it for 90 seconds at the beginning of class, bringing up global events throughout the semester or local events. Um, a lot of that allows students to let a breath out when they come into your classroom and get ready to learn. Um, next, I wanna talk about instructor reflection or sort of metacognition on the field. I'm leaving content for last because that's the one everyone fights to the death over. Um, I think all of us can, again, I'm talking to my cranky colleague in my head who says, I don't have time. I said, you know, you're there 90 seconds before, you occasionally can mention, you know, where does this new field of knowledge come from? How is it created? Who is involved? And that can be seeded throughout the semester. You don't have to go all out on it. So here's an example, biology class. I think every science class could have social justice in it. I, I picked one out of our course catalog, organismal diversity, structure function. How do you make that a social justice class? Or how do you add social justice elements to that? Well, commentary on the field. Who did the discovery? Who's, who's done the naming of all the different organisms we're studying? What's the historical role of wealth, leisure, social status in the study of organismal diversity? What's the role of colonial exploration in creating the study of diversity? Who traveled around the world? And the whole world of, of discovery, you know, who obviously indigenous groups were working, living, using different organis organisms, but they were who gave them the Latin name. And again, uh, that doesn't have to take over the whole class, but that can mean a lot to students that you're aware of the basically colonial history of, of science. Um, and you can sprinkle those in, lard those in throughout a lecture, throughout a semester. You could do it once a month. You could have a, every Monday, spend 10 minutes Googling and come up with something that you want to share to your students. So I'm trying to, you know, small, easy things for um, our favorite and who's left out of textbooks. Um, again, 10 minutes on Google will find you. And there's so many organizations now that have long lists of, uh, people, whether it's uh, people of color or women who have done amazing, amazing discoveries and work that are not in textbooks. Okay, last one, course content. I think social justice should be in all science courses. Uh, Juan showed some of the research on that. That depends whether your department thinks STEM students should have social justice as part of their outcomes. That's a critical part of the social ecology at your university or department. But I think even if they don't have a social justice topic, you know, coronavirus and race, HIV and gender, environmental studies and uh, environmental injustice, I think you still can bring in course content. 
So mm, my iPhone just booted up and that's okay. Um, again, tinker. This is this matters to students and particularly for faculty that are hesitant. I know Juan, I'm with I'm with Brian burning the chairs in the revolution, waving the flag. I want to do that, but I know not everyone's going that way. Um, so for organismal diversity. Uh, have a lecture on patenting of biodiversity or bioprospecting. I found a fascinating case that a US company actually did patent turmeric for wound healing, which has been used in Ayurvedic medicine for millennia, then they eventually got thrown out. Um, that could be a, a reading, that could be one homework assignment, you could do it twice over the semester. That helps create a tone that says, I recognize, first of all, builds wonderful interdisciplinary cross thinking skills, but it also recognizes that people are coming in, seeing the US and the process of US science from different global perspectives. Um, and there's huge opportunities in any basic biology class. Um, I don't think any biology class that talks about DNA <laughs> or chromosomes, which are quite a few of them, should do it without talking about the fact that the experience of racism literally changes your telomeres and your chromosome structure and weathers your molecules predisposing you to a whole group of diseases. And that is just while you're talking about telomere structure, you can weave that in. There's so many different ways where you can teach a standard molecular biology class and weave in um, a huge number of social justice issues. Okay. All right, but there isn't enough time. I'm gonna cover all the content. If you go back to brain science, the more students feel emotionally connected to content, the more they retain. Um, you have to build an emotional connection to activate strong memory. And by full sensorization, of course, I'm giving the whole sensor spiel of why everything should be fully sensorized. But if you aren't able to do that, or if it's a progression or you're edging along a colleague, even these small things matter. Um, I see this as you're signaling to your students, I care, I'm aware, I will act. Um, put them together. It, students notice I've been really pushing this in last year's course evaluations. Someone said I pushed beyond hegemonic frameworks. I was really impressed with that. Uh, but the, <laughs> but um, they, it was, it, they noticed. They noticed and they were deeply appreciative of it. I wanna leave this as a discussion question. This just came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Be paranoid, professors teach about race approach this the fall with anxiety, excuse me, I didn't say that well. Um, revised teaching guidance in Iowa made clear that most academic courses would not draw scrutiny if they are not mandatory. And as long as instructors who teach about concepts defined in the law, make sure they are germane to the class. I added the bold, the italics were in the article. Non-majors courses have wide latitude. They're not mandatory. You're not forcing someone to think about this. Oh, excuse me, obviously mandatory courses are under much more scrutiny and BIPOC faculty are under much more scrutiny. Um, there was a really interesting discussion there about protecting yourself through recordings so things can't be taken out of context, which is terrifying. Um, but I think it's worth to talk about, and mostly this was history courses, uh, social science courses. What does this mean for STEM courses? Are STEM faculty perhaps more protected because telomere weathering from racism is a fact. It's not interpretive. Whether I choose to include it is personal, but I'm curious of what how STEM can move given this new legislation. And do we have perhaps a little more latitude than our social science and humanities colleagues? And maybe we can come back to that later because I want to turn it over to Pat. Wow. Okay, boy, you guys have given me some uh, hard act to follow. Um, I did make some slides, but just for fun, because I wanted to have some pictures to look at instead of me. And I'm also going to, um, <laughs> I'm also going to try and um, keep my dog from intruding because he's getting really, really antsy at the moment. Um, but um, but so let me figure out how I'm supposed to do this. Share screen, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Share screen. Ryan. Whoop. 
No, no, it didn't work. Sorry, try it again. Ah, okay. Do do. I did that. Thank you. And we're going to try this here, see if we can get it to go to presentation mode, which it doesn't seem to want to do. You see your whole screen. Yeah, go yeah I know. I'm, I'm trying to make it behave itself, but it's not behaving. Go to view, maybe. PowerPoint view up the top there. All the way up, all the way up to, or oh, that works too. And fit to window. Hmm. I don't know why it's not behaving. Well, see up, see up the very top. All the way up at the very top. Uh, oh, you mean at the go in that view? Yeah, go, maybe go into that view and see if that does full screen. Uh, presenter view. Yeah, we'll try that. Or slide. Okay. Screen. Very good. <clears throat> Except now I can't see anything. Can you see anything? We can see it. I think. Ah, there it there. goes. Yay! Sorry. Woohoo! Sorry, kids. It's uh. It's been one of those days, so <laughs> perfect. <now. laughs> and sometimes the nothing works, right? It's just like, oh, okay. So anyway, I just thought I'd do a little brief introduction of some things that uh, I've been involved with over the years and how it relates to some of the things I heard from all of you, just for fun. So um, I wanted to start out with a reminder that at the very first part of this Center Summer Institute. Eliza put the message out that, you know, this is Sensor's moment in, 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 in moving us forward and that science education is civics education. They're not in opposition. We have to make this work together, right? So I thought I wanted to start with that. And also in that same um, uh, intro, she said, should we reallocate funds and mandated civic content? replace time spent on STEM, is that the answer? Or can we do both things at once? And she said, sensor has the answer. And I say, so does the Accelerating Systemic Change Initiative and BioQuest and Scientist Spotlights and a whole bunch of other people. And what we need to learn to do is learn from each other and collaborate and take this really forward, right? So uh, briefly, I wanted to say that I've been involved in things that I think um, have been invested in social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, since grad school. I actually taught a summer institute for uh, counter stereotypical science students at the University of Florida, I don't know how many millions of years ago, but probably like 40-ish, 50-ish. And I've always thought about how we can make our sciences more collaborative and more uh, just and less unequal and attract different people in. And to think about what do we mean by equality and what do we mean by equity and what do we mean by justice in, um, in our teaching of classes, not just in science classes, all of our classes, but I also think that the STEM disciplines have been um, uniquely rec recalcitrant. Um, and um, so we really have to work hard, as Cheryl was telling us, as Brian was telling us, and as that initial beautiful research project was telling us, we really have to work hard to make our programs work better. So, you know, I want to just the list over on the left is just a couple of things that I've been involved with over the years. But um, what I really think is important is that it's not just undergraduate education that we need to reach, it's um, K-12 education and we can collaborate with them and um, graduate education because if that doesn't change, we won't have the faculty that can see what needs to happen and what needs to be done. Um, so I just wanna tell you one little story from the GK-12 program though. So we actually had a program for about 10 years 
that paired graduate students from STEM disciplines with middle school and high school teachers to develop problem-based learning and case-based learning curriculum that tied the, the disciplines they were teaching to social problems. And so we had this wonderful project that um, had graduate students working on um, work in environmental sciences where they were looking at um, the influence on of, um, different pesticides in farms. And they took it to the K-12 level and created community gardens and helped to develop new things. Uh, they uh, studied uh, some that were studying air pollution in chemistry and they got the teachers and the students involved in an air pollution project that studied the buses in the Atlanta public school system as opposed to the teacher's cars output and my Prius, <laughs> right? And other kinds of things like that, all kinds of really cool projects that I think we need to think about if there aren't ways that we can include all of that in our undergraduate education and in our uh, reinvent GK-12 for graduate education to get people invested in these ideas from, from the very beginning. Um, so anyway, just a thought. So I wanna tell you about the most important projects lately. So in uh, last summer at the Biome Summer Institute, um, we had a social event one night and everybody could form a table and talk about whatever they wanted to, right? So I said, I wanna talk about social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And 30 people showed up out of the 50 people at the conference. And we started talking and we actually formed a working groups for last fall. And these working groups, I'm gonna flip through a couple of them just for fun. The working groups ended up creating faculty mentoring networks. We had three and they focused on diversity, inclusion, and social justice issues. One of them, this one featured at the moment, um, was scientist spotlights with data and with counter stereotypical um, scientists. Um, and we think everybody can do this. Chemists can do it, mathematicians can do it, physicists can do it, biologists can do it. You can identify counter stereotypical scientists and feature their data and their papers. Um, and the, the more the merrier, right? And um, in our, our judgment, the younger the better. So we thought grad students and postdocs and really early career faculty um, can be featured for the work that they're doing right now that would excite students and let them know that they too can do science. And uh, the reason I, I picked this one with a picture of Sue Ann Yang is because bright and wonderful woman that she is, she not only helped lead this group, but she also with her friend, Rachel Pig, wrote a grant to extend this initiative. So you too, if you wanna focus on scientists, spotlights and data, can join us over the next five years and create new things for your courses and take it forward, okay? So an, another thing I wanted to mention is the um, Accelerating Systemic Change Initiative. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna send you all, all the links to this and you can have the, the PowerPoints and do what you please with them. Um, but um, we have a working group that's called Social Justice, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And it operates on three different levels with, um, with three co-leaders um, that we're working on uh, systemic change levels at the institutional level. We're working on faculty diversity initiatives, student development initiatives, and other kinds of things. So I'm gonna urge you to join us. And the link on this page is to a blog post that I wrote over one of the things that I think is absolutely essential for us to do um, to help take the social justice and center-like uh, kinds of things forward. And that is we have to diversify the STEM faculty. And so this uh, year we ran a series of conversations with deans, provosts, faculty, and anybody who wanted to participate um, on how to recruit diverse faculty. And we've accumulated huge amounts of resources 
that you too can use to diversify your faculty, which will help us maintain the challenge or get to the challenge of converting all the different faculty to help us. So this uh, scientist spotlights and data nuggets group this year, the links on the right are some of the resources that you can click on that we created, uh, that each of our members created on uh, different scientists and their data. Every one of them feature, features a graph or a data a nugget from a paper by the scientists involved. And um, they were all over the map from, as you can see, urban st streams to co coyotes. Um, and I, I love the, the picture on the right, which I swiped from somewhere, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but I just love the idea of us thinking about our students, we do teach students, and we want students to see themselves able to do what we can do. And so if we can just feature more people that look like them. The other big one, a faculty mentoring network that um, emerged from this, and um, the links that are on the side here go to uh, the, um, <clears throat> the workshops that we did at the biome about two weeks ago. So you can also go and see all these things. All the materials have been developed. The other feature was we decided to focus on the impact of redlining on cities around the country. Um, and we used tools from various social justice sites that show graphing and mapping and that allow you to ex allow students to explore health inequities and all kinds of other things in um, many cities that, um, uh, that emerged from the redlining that started in the 1930s, right? So there, there's, a, there's a wonderful data site with maps that you can feature and then also look at health disparities um, in those same cities for 150 cities. So imagine if you use that in your class and people can pick their own city and look at census blocks and compare them. And then they can also have projects that emerge from that. So one of our, uh, one of our uh, projects was using things like um, iNaturalist to examine biodiversity in different areas that had different redlining um, aspects in the past. One of them looked at water quality in the areas uh, across cities. One of them looked at you know, um, a tree cover using uh, an actual field experiment where st students are, are actually collecting data about the tree cover and the impact of that tree cover in different areas that are influenced by a social justice issue. And we hope to expand more this year. So this, uh, this is a description of, our, of the workshop, one of the workshops that we did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see, bazillions of co-authors. And this group is now writing a new grant too. So we may have money to help you revamp your curriculum in those regards in the near future, I hope so. We'll see. So we also had one on environmental focused issues as well as, well as one on health disparity issues. And so what I want to do is try and excite you to think about all the things we've learned this afternoon about where the data stands and, and, and who needs to change and what kinds of things that, um, that we uh, can do and who needs to make those changes. Um, and I want to encourage you to think about joining faculty mentoring networks on CUBES in spring for these kinds of issues. I wanna, think, I wanna encourage you to think about collaborating with your ideas about where you're gonna take your sensor project with the scientist spotlights and biography project that is gonna have new funded opportunities to get involved um, and other kinds of things. I want you to think about collaborating with the Accelerating Systemic Change Initiative and bringing your ideas to that group. Um, and I just think that we can start removing some of the barriers to change that you've, we've thought about. But Brian has brought some up, Cheryl has brought some up. Some of the 
things like content domination and people thinking, oh my God, there's no room in the curriculum. You know, we, we need to start remembering the old cry from 35 years ago, less is more, right? Content does not have to dominate everything. Content resides in books, content changes. But we need to think about how that content can link the things people really care about, right? We need to think about how to get those silos broken down so that actually biologists talk to chemists and environmental scientists and I don't know, oh my God, physicists and mathematicians and social scientists and psychologists, so that we break those barriers and bring all of that together into what we're trying to do so that we address the faculty resistors and figure out how to make them come along. And I tell you, most of the younger, newer faculty are really there with us. They are acting on these social change initiatives, but we still have some control people that eh, really don't get it. And we gotta figure out how to get them there, right? We have student resistors too. And one of the things we have to think about as we examine social justice initiatives is how do we get all students to think about these issues and bring in the ones who are, um, there was an article in the Chronicle this week about the right-wing um, students who are really pushing back, not just on faculty, but on their colleges and, and on um, their boards of trustees. Uh, we need to actually get them to listen to us too. And that may be one of the hardest things that we have to do. And boy, do we have resistance in that ecosystem that was mentioned um, by Cheryl uh, in our tenure and promotion values. We have to think about ways we can reward people differently. And I found this really cool little graphic um, uh, from 2004, but you know, it's okay. Um, uh, that might help us think about some of the things we could do um, to look at the institutional change and the injustice in our systems and how to change it. And I hope we might talk a little bit about some of that later on. And then I wanted to just end with something that was from, um, from, um, Eliza's talk again that Jay Labov presented in, in an article that he, he did on uh, where he mentioned censors so much, right? And he said, we have to think about how the funds are spent. He said, we have to teach with greater context. Oh, please, could we really teach with context instead of just all those little details of the Krebs cycle? Um, you know, can we really think about teaching our disciplines because we're teaching students and students will be citizens and lawyers and congressmen and presidents and moms and dads and make decisions every day that really involve civic engagement. So we really have to go there. And I really do think that science education is for civic engagement and responsibility, but we have to convince our colleagues to get there. So I wanted to end on that note and let me see if I can get my screen to come back just for fun. Um, and um, we have some questions. We'll, we'll raise some questions in the chat, but we have a, a number of questions that we thought we might come up with if you guys don't want to start. But we've taken a lot of your time already. So I think it's time for you to talk. So oh, Pat, you're still sharing your screen so we can see oh, your- okay. i got to undo that. Yes, I yeah. do. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I just don't want to- Where is it? <laughs> We're going to unshare down the bottom, I think. Yeah, <laughs> except that the screen thing went, oh, wait a minute, stop here. I got it. There you yeah. go. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> No, no. Okay. It's uh, I have two screens and uh, and only one of them the camera works, so it does weird stuff <laughs> tripping back and forth. So, but anyway, so. Well, this is pretty heady stuff for us to be grappling with. So, Pat, why don't you pose some questions and prompts for 
for us to ponder. Okie dokie. So shall I put a few in the chat or do you want to just uh, just let you, me you jump in? You can say them, you can put them in the chat. I mean, I think, okay. you know, we've collectively, a lot of us have been talking about this for 20 years now, right? So, in, yes. and working, working in our, in our rivulets and the places that we do have levers. And in fact, we're, you know, we're all cited in levers of change, that AAAS thing. Um, so we are, but, oh yeah, Brian's obviously saying that's the, he's the polite person here. So <laughs> <tell him he's laughs> not have any questions. Um, certainly. But anyway, 20 years, we got we to gotta figure out an action plan. But actually, yes, go ahead. I, I can't raise a hand, but other people can. <laughs> then that's our hand up there. I turned off my self view, so I couldn't even tell if it was working. <laughs> um, I had a question. This is kind of working back to um, some of the stuff that Brian said about it, actually Cheryl as well, about um, just the massive need for systemic change. I had the very sobering experience uh, a couple of weeks ago of being asked by a um, black graduate student in our ed leadership program to read her dissertation, which was a um, ethnographic study of the experience of black graduate students at our predominantly white institution. And it was excruciating. Um, and what I found most miserable was the reports that faculty who were teaching nominally social justice courses were so tone deaf and had absolutely no, I mean, I, I know the Vermont white progressive and they think they, they do, I, I just, how, so it's not just convincing the, <laughs> the brand of these. Um, so it's not just these people who are resistors, it's these people who think that they are already doing this, who are totally tone deaf. And we, we recruit and lose more what, Black and Hispanic faculty at UVM. Our turnover is ridiculously high. And it's just, it's just appalling. And I don't have any solutions. I'm just throwing this out there that it's not enough to get our black and other historically marginalized students through the program and into graduate school. We have to get them to the point where they feel welcome at our institutions. And then I'm gonna shut up. I don't have any answers. I'm just throwing that out there as another layer. But, 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 there, but there actually are some answers out there. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna send you some material, uh, Lyndon, on, uh, that we've developed over the couple of years um, with the ASCN group. Um, and also APLU has some really, really good materials out there. Cheryl was gonna um, say something too there. Sorry, sorry, Pat. Cheryl, were you gonna say something? No, I'm writing back to Katya and saying, <laughs> just sorry, just being <laughs> a comment in the chat, just to sign black in the ivory Twitter is training, but whatever. It's which is yeah. Brian, did, I don't know. So I learned something that was very new to me a couple of years ago. Um, we had a young woman um who was denied reappointment. And I was on the committee that reviewed her, her appeal. And um, these cases are all very complicated. Um, one element of it obviously was she was a young woman and the department head in this case happened also to be a woman. Um, another one was actually she was young and vivacious and energetic and um, the people that were in, most instrumental in denying her reappointment were older and less vivacious and more tired. Um, the thing that struck me, however, was that one of the things that the case turned on. So I, I wanna emphasize that this was somebody from the Department of Be Behavioral Science and Leadership. So it's very much a social science. And we tend to think, the, the one I wanna talk about, we tend to associate with STEM, but I think it's actually much more broad. So what happened was um, one of the critiques of her teaching 
was that she was, the code word they used was too passionate about her subject. And they viewed, I shouldn't say about her subject, she was too passionate in the classroom. And their view was that what was going on in the classroom was very objective and you had to keep emotions, um, anything that was subjective out of it. So they had a very sharp distinction between objective, almost scientific and subjective where the values came in and things like that. And that's, that's very interesting to me. So we tend to, I'm actually a little bit worried that our emphasis on science right now is gonna further that, that there's this idea that there's this objective um, truth and that's the domain of science and the other the values things are someplace else. But again, I wanna emphasize that this was not a case that involved the hard sciences or natural sciences. It was a case that basically involved social sciences. So what, what was revelatory to me was that this, this sharp distinction between objective and subjective um, is one that actually makes it much more difficult to talk about social justice issues in the classroom. And in this case, impact in somebody's career. And of course, the sad thing is that this is a person who would have added a tremendous amount to the institution, um, but as a result, we, we no longer have her. Well, I see some nice chats about teaching evaluations. How do we get rid of them? What was interesting in this case was that her teaching evaluations were really good. Mm -hmm. And the students, um, I have to be a little bit careful about what I say, because I was, this is- um, We're recording, we're recording, Frank, so. <laughs> yeah, so the, the teaching evaluation is very, very strong. And she got tremendous support from her students um, to the point where, um, some of the people that were involved on the other side, um, uh, I don't know how to say this. They said some things about the students that I would not have said, <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Can I just, just quickly, uh, you know, maybe try to address both Lyndon, Lyndon's and Frank's comments in tandem. Um, uh, just, just because I see something that arise sometimes in these, um, conversations that I, I think we can address perhaps more directly than we have in the past, right? So we have we have all this scholarship about, you know, faculty who don't feel like they belong, they leave for whatever reason, you know, Lina attributes themselves, you know, attributes to some of that. But what I don't what I don't hear enough of is okay, if, if you are a university and you have disproportionate uh, attrition by faculty of color. You you need to find out why, right? So there needs I need to hear something along the lines of an exit interview that is not just done because it's an HR procedure, but it's it's data you are collecting to tell you something about yourself. And so therefore, when you get that data, then you start to ask yourself some questions about we didn't you know maybe we didn't realize we were creating an environment where people cannot thrive. We thought they would just come here and you know, because we're Duke or because we're UVM or whatever it is, you know, they would just be great. But we didn't realize all these microaggressions that were happening, right? So, so what happens is that people leave and then everybody kind of stands around and scratch their head like, we don't know why they left, don't know why they left. We have this scholarship, but then the scholarship is what it is, right? It's scholarship. So we are not saying that this scholarship is wrong, but that's not like an institutional data set, right? So you, you can't necessarily just correlate what such and such it all published to what happened at your school. You wanna actually ask those people, you know, what was your experience like? So, you know, I, I, was, I was recruited away from, you, from URI and, and actually really loved URI, I think it's a good school. But look, man, I could tell you, like there was a time people called me a minority hire. Like, like why would you, <laughs> like, why would you <laughs> write that on a public document, right? But you know, Brian's Brian, so I don't care. I know I persist regardless, but I know there are other people who would say, look, man, I don't need this. And they would leave. But unless you are going to ask them to really articulate that for you and learn from it, you know, I, I'll just, just really quickly, you know, say this, I'm working with a, a graduate student who's looking at, and I know this is at the undergrad level, but she's looking at retention and attrition in, in computer science. And she interviewed about 25 people who left and 25 people who stayed in the major. And what we find is really interesting in the data 
is that the people who stay actually are reporting some of the same toxic environmental qualities that than the people who left. But the difference is they just found a way to persist in spite of, right? So it's not like they stayed and they just found it was great. No, no, no. This is shitty, <laughs> but here's how we managed it, right? The people who left, like, well, we just couldn't manage it. So, so the, the, the constant was a toxic environment, right? So, so, I mean, that's a little bit of a sidebar, but I, I do, I would encourage those of you who have access to that power policy, you know, whatever it is, you know, if, find out locally what's driving your attrition, right? Be willing to ask the students, the faculty, the grad students, whatever, like have them speak anonymously what, you know, what the experience has been and, and be willing to learn from that. Because then, then I feel we end up just having the same conversations like in this cycle and, you know, look into the research. I mean, the research is fine, but what's happening by you, right? What's happening on your campus? That's what we have to find out. And I'd like to add to that, like the thing that I find worrisome, and this, please don't misunderstand me when I say this, but a lot of institutions are hiring diversity officers and it seems to me like there's no action that goes along with that. So it's not enough to give an office to a diversity officer the support and the resources and the, how would you say, the institutional um, values have to be somehow connected to that office, right? So you can't just plunk it. Oh, we hired a diversity officer, so we're doing our bit. But that all has to be, that's all, all has to be integrated into the whole system, do you know? Cheryl? Duke, Duke, I said, yeah, it's a lot of virtue signaling of, well, we've got it covered. We, we put an office, we put some money into it. Duke's done some, I think, some really good stuff. We've had uh, from my colleagues tell me, uh, students, faculty of color. I mean, we had a huge attrition. It was just, you know, great people in, great people out, great people in, great people out. And um, I think they did do some significant exit interviews, but um, we now have a, a black think tank. Like it's like a black caucus on campus. There's a mutual scholarship support for research. I mean, not that these people needed, you know, their scholarship wasn't the problem, but, uh, you know, it goes back to the, the psychological safety and Maslow's hierarchy of feeling of belonging but a lot more, rather than just finding a buddy to go have a drink with and complain about how bad it was at work, they structured and put money into organizations on campus to support black faculty, as well as work to educate everyone else to make it, try and make it less, less toxic. But it's been an interesting approach rather than just uh, stealing the best black colleague from Harvard and having them leave three years later from here as well, which. So, so we seem to have gotten a, a little, um, a little off the topic we started on, but I still think this is really critical and really important. So I wanna leave, I wanna have us have some positive statements about this. So in the past several years, many institutions, STEM faculty, partly because of Brian and others like him, read Becoming an Anti-Racist Educator, joined groups, did discussions. At uh, our institution, um, over 70 faculty from psychology, biology, physics, and math had reading groups. And then with graduate students and undergraduates formed committees to make changes happen, right? So I want you to think positive. We can change this. Example, every one of our biology faculty members on their website now has a real diversity statement that was constructed with their undergrads, their grad students, and themselves about what they really mean to move this forward several social justice kinds of um, courses and uh, projects came out of those discussions that might not have happened 10 years ago. And besides, I remember somebody saying once that eventually some of those other folks will, you know, die <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. We, 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 <laughs> we can change who we've got and we can make change happen. I want us to think about what we can do. So 
So it's really important that we address these faculty issues, really important. It's also important to think about what can we do about including social justice in our courses? What can we do to be change agents in our departments and our communities? So maybe we could talk about that for a few minutes. Well, yeah, well, Pat, just, you know, to build on your point quickly and, you know, maybe take the, uh, you know, slightly optimistic path here. Um, there, are, there are examples out there where people have, where institutions have made good decisions and they're seeing results, right? Um, I was particularly moved by two examples, University of Houston downtown and University of North Carolina at Greensboro. At University of Houston downtown, who diversified their faculty like 40, 50%, some of the, the, the faculty that they brought, you know, they were they're saying one of the things that really excited them was they were interested in them not because they were Black or Hispanic, they were interested in them because of their research. They made it clear, here's, the, here's how the expertise that you have can benefit this Houston downtown community. So then you didn't feel like you were going there to check a box, right? UNC Greensboro talked about, you know, you get to a point where there's such a critical mass of minoritized faculty that it's actually not minoritized. It's not even a thing to be a minority right. faculty, right? And so, and that's, that's ultimately, that's actually what most people want. Like, you don't want to come and be the ex faculty member who does physics. You just want to be the person who does physics in this way. And that frees you from all of the contingencies associated with the identity. Um, you know, Valencia College is another place that does a lot of really, really impressive work. The, you know, the examples are not as much as we would like to see right now, but they are there and it, it'd be good to learn from them. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Pat. I just want to say, you know, move a little uh, positively forward. Uh, yeah, I guess I, <coughs> I guess I am in optimistic mode. I think we can make lots of change happen right now, right? Well, of course, I'm emeritus, so I have to do it by helping you guys do it. So you all are the people I want to start moving and shaking the system up. And uh, let me help you if I can. <laughs> well, I, I, I think in light of what Brian just reported from schools that are successfully not only diversifying, but they're doing it on the basis of the need to have certain kinds of research done. And part of me wonders with the, the terrible global civic problems that we've got right now, whether if you could just name COVID, climate change, massive inequality, we have, we have a, a, a structural problems that you that are both civic they're local but they're also global to some extent we need more faculty who are looking at that in, a, in an integrated social justice and uh, systems approach to these problems and if one's research is right that's more likely to be the future scientists coming uh, you know who are people of color and and women because they're the ones more likely to be attracted to this kind of research. So it, I'm wondering if there's maybe a possible sea change in valuing research that tackles real problems and not just abstract disciplinary problems, because that's what I think you were saying about those schools that managed to diversify the faculty because they were choosing people based on research that actually was relevant to the community. I was also going to add it just I just stuck it in the chat there that I, I had been reading a lot about folks who are doing research in these areas and really struggling to get it funded, really struggling to get it published. Um, and as a consequence of that are not seen to be as valuable in terms of a hire. So, I mean, Brian is extraordinarily uh, scholar, scholarly and has published and has funded and everything else, but a lot of folks, persons of color just struggle to get funding generally, right? We know this, women especially, right? And then if you if you combine that with research into race and everything else, it, it is incredibly hard to, to get that kind of work funded, so. And I think there's data on that in terms of particularly yeah. medicine, for example, yeah. and mm -hmm. medical research. Mm -hmm. um, the people who tackle 
relevant problems for non-majority majority populations are, are having a lot of trouble getting funded. True. Right. Well, no, yeah, no but, I mean, it, but, but, but look, it, climate change has really hit. Yeah. The <laughs> U.S. government is investing in these kinds of things. That research can be funded, but we have to push it. Yeah. Yeah, but Pat, to push back on what you just said, I mean, even if you look at COVID, even during COVID, women were still not getting papers published. Right. So, I mean, right. I understand what you're saying, but the, the system is the problem. I, I, and there's a little bit of a reactionary piece to it, right? I mean, even Dr. Fauci made the point that one of the reasons why COVID research had stopped after um, MERS was that MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome, mm -hmm. which is kind of, you know, it disappeared. And so NIH immediately put like this. So, so oh, the the, there's always this sort of kind of reactionary kind of style to it, you know. Um, and 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 not to not to kind of go back to pessimism, Pat, but but I think I think Davida's point is worth pondering on because sometimes we are not willing to reflect on the biases we have within our own community. The point that Eliza raised um, about um, you know what people research and getting it supported and and kind of group think associated with fields was really well articulated in the book Thinking Fast and Slow by, by Daniel oh, Kahneman, yeah. right? He talks about that, you know, he did his studies with statisticians, right? And he showed like even, even some of our most sophisticated, you know, allies. And I remember early in my career, I had an experience that was, I still reflect on because I thought it was interesting. I had sent a paper. In fact, it's the paper most people probably know deep teaching and stuff. I actually sent that to a journal which arguably is the most famous journal in the discipline-based education research field, you know, to the extent that's a field. And what I was told was, no, no, Brian, what we want is like, we just want, just give us some 10 strategies to do. And, you know, people just want really practical. I'm like, no, 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 no. That, that's not how this stuff works, right? Now I could have made the decision like, ooh, this is the journal in my field that everybody knows. And so I must toe the line and I must write my papers in a way that they can understand because if I don't get it in this journal, I won't get tenure. And I, no. I said, no, 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 this is not the message that you need. You actually probably don't even know the message that you need. So I need to find a place that will allow that message to be articulated in the way it needs to be. And whenever you're ready, you will catch up, right? So, so there's some there's some risk involved, right? Because not everybody's willing to do that, right? If you kind of have a mortgage payment tied to tenure, then you might say, look, man, I just need to, you know, the plantation politics, right? I need to just do what do what master says, and then then when I get tenure, then maybe I'll take a risk or two. So, so we we can't. I'm with your part. We have to be optimistic, but in that path to optimism, you know, let's be willing to kind of face down all of the kind of levers of power we all are kind of dancing around to do the work well, we but, do. Yeah. But, but Brian, that's what I mean about we have to think about how to be change agents within our system. And that means maybe we have to change the tenure and promotion policies. Maybe we have to get, you know, outside of our own disciplines. Maybe we have to do some other kinds of things that will make the system more compatible, that will allow people in and have them feel comfortable and allow them to change the curriculum to teach about social issues in a biology course or a physics course. Maybe we have to, you know. Well, well to be fair, I think some of that is happening. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the optimistic part, you know, I have a couple of grants about that. and. I know I mean, well, I many think of this group who do that, so. It's working because it works. I mean, I, to, to some extent, the argument has been made that the, 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 this, these blind spots and whatever are hindering. You can't claim you want diversity on the one hand and then somehow never find people of color's work quite right for the discipline. You know, you can't, you can't claim both of these goals. Right, and I think there's a certain kind of hypocrisy that research itself could expose. The way the MIT research po showed that when you had two two resumes and a woman's name was on one and a man's name was in the other, but they're identical, somehow the man was somehow ranked higher. So, so we've got data and research could actually show and expose some of the stuff. Well, that's that's at least my hope. Amy. Yeah. So um, the 
a really interesting conversation, um, very thought provoking and also very reminiscent of a lot of conversations we've had um, over the years, especially in the center community. Um, and I, you know, there was the quote that um, we teach students, not subjects. I think it's also important to recognize that the systems we're talking about changing are made up of people. They're made up of faculty, of colleagues. Um, I work and have worked for 30 years at an institution that is funda fundamentally based on principles of social justice. Brian, you were at Santa Clara, did something with us last fall. I think it was last fall or something. Mm -hmm. and, and we're a Jesuit school. Yet I can give you a list of names of faculty who were denied tenure because their work was based in social justice and not in the traditional disciplinary field. And they were given a lot of bum advice along the way, um, one would say, um, to, to not focus on work that was uh, more traditional. And that traditional perspective doesn't come from the administration. It never came from the president who was a Jesuit priest. It came from the faculty in those departments. And also the hiring of faculty comes from the search committees and the faculty in those departments. And so as we begin and, and as we think about this work, um, the change agents really need to be on that ground at that grassroots level. Because I can pretty much guarantee, I have seen deans, provosts, multiple presidents at my institution be committed to social justice, be committed to diversity and inclusion, uh, and, and have their own families be incredibly diverse, but hit a brick wall because a department doesn't bring in a diverse pool of candidates. And so I think that um, uh, as we consider the future. I want to ask all of you too, is this moment in time different? Is this different than two years ago? Has enough happened through the pandemic, through the racial justice issues going on? Has enough happened to shift our institutional barriers and our academic faculty mindset to move this forward. Because we've had a, more than an earthquake, more than a tidal wave occur in our society. And is that enough to shake things up to make our, uh, our eyes be open? Or is this like a parkland moment, you know? I think it's different in two ways, you know, one, one good and the other bad, but a consequence of the first one. Um, social justice issues are certainly very, very visible now and much more visible, much more open than they were before. But the problem is that that has, there's much more increased polarization and that polarization, which was maybe in the background before is now also much more, more overt. So it's, there's a good side and a bad side to it. I think it's going to depend on Katyun has her hand. Oh, hi everyone. Sorry, I'm in a very hot um, compunction about putting myself out there as who I am, because uh, there were five boys after me before there was even another girl. So you know, uh, and I think we all come from different places and different um, different traditions and. Um, and have different concerns about, um, about the tenure and promotion system. I mean, some of us jumped off that track like 30 years ago, I gave up a tenured position to come to Emory as a non-tenure track leader of a five-year grant that could have lasted five years. But, you know, I think it just depends on 
where you're coming from and who you are, how you handle that. I actually like making my piece earrings accessible and my positions accessible to people. Um, I try not to do it in a confrontational manner, but I certainly want to be who I am and bring the causes I think that are important to the table, even if it's not always appreciated. But, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the only way to do it. I think you can listen. I think you can infiltrate. I think you can uh, bring other voices to the table. But I really do think right now we're at a place where we can make some real change happen in STEM departments. That's not where it was 10 years ago or five years ago or 30 years ago. There are young people willing to work with us to make change happen in graduate education, postdoctoral education, and in our courses. And now is the time to like jump on it, as far as I'm concerned. Do you need to raise your hand a second? Thing? Funding out there that you, there's a brand new NSF grant that says we're all about race and diversity. What are you going to do? Just tell us what you want to do and we'll give you some money. Katyn, did you raise your hand a second time? Yeah, yeah, I did. I just, I just wanted to say to Pat, I'm not, I'm not even saying something I think different than what you're saying, Pat. I mean, I did the same thing. I didn't get a tenure track position specifically because I didn't want to be stuck having to do those things. What I'm saying is, I literally wear a different hat depending on where I am, right? Like, I know where I am, and if I come into, you know. UC Fullerton's uh, development, faculty development workshop, and I start start off really strong about social justice, it's not going to go anywhere. I'm going to lose people. They're going to walk out of the room. And so I, I'm just suggesting that if, if we really feel we are change agents, that we have to know where we are. And sometimes, you know, you adjust just ever so slightly. I'm not saying you give up your values or you do something different. You just call it something different. So it doesn't terrify people. I, I or it doesn't, totally agree. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And do that's not wear the same clothes I wear in my faculty meetings when I go to meet with the president or the board of trustees. So I know how to code switch too. Um, I just think we need some people that are really out there. That's all. Yeah. I, but think I, 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 I want to address Katya Yuna and Frank's point um, together if I can, because I, I think it's a really, really important one. I think we sometimes underestimate how much time these conversations is with the choir and how many non-choir members are not here. And, and to both of their points, um, they some a lot of times represent the barriers to that real progress that we're looking for. Um, I think a key thing in what, um, you know, Kathy Yoon's anecdote points out is, is it's just a reminder that yes, this may be a virtuous exercise, this may be a moral exercise, but it's also a political one. And I was, um, I was moved by a story I read a couple of weeks ago in Missouri where doctors and nurses were reporting, as you may or may not know, the vaccination rates in Missouri is very low and also the COVID cases are very high. And, and doctors and nurses were reporting people coming in to get vaccines, but telling them, telling the doctors and nurses, please don't tell don't anyone tell I anybody. came to get, right? Yeah. And the, the sociologists who wrote the argument to give sense a shout out here, um, were making the point that you have to understand what people's cultural reference points are. Right when they when they, when you're trying to change their minds, right when they decide not to get a vaccine or believe all this stuff is a conspiracy, this is not just people not believing data or not scientists or stupid. These are their friend. This is how they get jobs. This is how they get married. This is how they, they form social circles. Right. So if you're not speaking to that that context, right, and you're just gonna come with a graph and be like, believe me, or else you're stupid. That's, that's not the way we're going to move it, right? So I think there's a similar uh, a lesson here for us, right? That when we go into situations where you, you might, you know, but perhaps by your own intuition detect that there's mostly non-choir members and choir members, you have to kind of think about what are the social norms here that are pushing um, a belief perhaps in a different kind of social structure, right? And that may involve... And, I, and Kathy, I'm with you, you know, I, I say, I, I like the labeling your classes, advanced bio, whatever, and kind of sneaking this stuff in because you have to be willing to have a colleague tell you what that colleague told you, right? Because that's your way in, 
right? So because maybe that colleague would, would actually have coffee with you and you can have a different kind of conversation. If you had come at them with your, you know, uh, like fight the power stuff, they would never come to you, right? And you would never have that opportunity. And so you, you almost have to be willing to, to like, I don't want to use the word sell out because it's not really that, but, but, but here things that, that you might want to react perhaps in a different kind of way, right? But, but just, that's your way in. That's your way in because your goal is to find a better angel, not, not to win an argument. Your goal is to find a better angel and appeal to that, right? Um, so yeah, thanks for raising that. I think that was a really good good thing to end on, assuming that's what we're doing. But <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. But you know that point I just wrote in the chat. We used to have a lot of um, presentations by Dan Kahan, who run the Cultural Cognition Project at Yale, and and Dan would say, "Look, if if your church would ostracize you for saying you believe in, ev in evolution." you're not going to say you believe in it. It's worth much more to you to just say, I don't right. believe in it than right. it is to say you do because right. you're, you're, you're raising the risk factor. And I think that's the question with the vaccines too. It's like, don't tell anybody because I'll ruin my reputation in the circle that I'm in. So we also have to understand that ideological pressure to whether you believe in something or not, not to espouse or it's another another big challenge for us as communicators as well as educators you know we also have to advocate it, it is but you know if we're gonna make systemic change happen at our institutions along all of these lines for diversity and inclusion and and social justice then we have to push some of those down absolutely we, we, have, we have to push our board of trustees we have to push our higher uh, our suite of provosts. <laughs> well, yeah. Get, it's easier to get people to push from the inside than, because again, it's it's brain behavior. Not that, just once, if you're an outsider and you're they're perceived as hostile, then all your all your you can't. Listen, it's ever thus. So, well, we have to, <laughs> we have to take some of our cues from social movement history because you yep. know these things are hard you know yeah. the stuff that social social movements did in 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 history were hard but they they some of them were <coughs> and i guess we have to also look at at that advocacy role and and that constant pressure i i feel like we should tie it up we already lost i get, didn't get a chance to thank all of you the fabulous people for for such a rich conversation which we are taping um, but I did want to say I'm going to edit some of it so people don't have to worry or feel self-conscious if it's out there. And we also can decide how to share it. We don't, this is not assumed that we would send it out to the world and put it on YouTube. Yeah, we can do the, so, first, the presentations part, maybe. Yeah, and I, I just like thank you from the bottom of my heart because you're really helping. This is not easy and we've got multiple fronts that we have to work on. So, and we will do it. Oh, yeah, thanks you everybody. Can, you it was don't, really fun listening and talking, talking with you. Well, so, thank you, Pat, and thank you. Even though my dog thanks is so much for my chair the whole time. Thanks, y'all. I'll thanks. write to Good Brian. Good to see you all. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Tools. Thank you.